I personally love books that are going to eviscerate me. Absolutely fucking crazy. <laughs> Seem to realize what he said the same moment she did. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. I'm gonna like lose my shit because that's insane. Like it's incredibly written and I love it. I just wanna cry, I wanna scream, I wanna throw up. This was unhinged. Like he's just a man. Ah, oh, I need to sleep. Hey everyone, it's Jenny, and welcome back to my channel, This Story Ain't Over. Today's video is one that I'm so freaking excited for. I'm gonna be reading Booktuber's favorite books of 2023. I've done this video in various iterations before and I've always enjoyed it so much, but this time I wanted to read more books and try to be a little bit easier on myself and pick more books from my TBR. So in this video, you will see me read 11 different books from different booktubers that I admire, that I've recently subscribed to, that I think are just cool. I'm gonna play the clip of each booktuber talking about each of those books as we go along, but you will notice that I have picked multiple favorites from certain booktubers and only one from others. This was basically just based off of the books that were on my TBR and books that I wanted to read. I wanted to make it as easy and enjoyable as possible for me to go through all of these books, so you'll see that there's a bit of a variety. With that said, I'm just gonna quickly tell you which books I'm gonna be reading from each booktuber. So from Hannah from A Clockwork Reader, I'm gonna be reading The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, Women Eating by Claire Coda, As Long as the Lemon Trees Grow by Zulfa Katu, and then I'll also be reading A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed, and this was also a favorite of Cindy from With Cindy. Bright Young Woman by Jessica Knoll was another favorite of Cindy's, and it was also a favorite of Meg from Meg with Books. And Meg also really loved Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry, and she also loved The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz, and this was also a favorite of Gabby from Gabby Reads. And then Gabby was also a fan of The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston, and this was also a favorite of Chandler Ainsley's, Destiny Sidewell's, and Haley Fans. Now both Chandler Chandler and Haley also really enjoyed None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. And then finally, I'll also be reading one book from the internet's resident librarian, Jack Edwards, and that is I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. I'll give you guys my final thoughts on all of these books at the end of the video as well, but for now, let's just jump into the first book, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana. Moving along, the next favorite read of mine is one of my favorite romance reads of the year, fantasy romance, if you want to call it that, but it's more romance based than fantasy. Um, and that is The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. Is. This book is so good. It's so good and I need more people to read it. I am in love with this story. It is so wholesome. It's so heartwarming. The greatest found family. Such a fantastic romance. Wonderful, lovable characters. A perfect balance between the romance and the plot. I don't know what else there is to say about this book to convince you to read it. You just, you need to. Hello my friends, it is January 1st and I have started The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mangana. I am already loving this. I am only a few chapters in, like three or four. We've met our main characters, our whole cast, and I am just loving how diverse this cast of characters is. So essentially the premise of this book is that our main character, Mika Moon, who is South Asian, she is a witch. And in this version of our world, witches are always born as orphans. After they're born, they're shortly orphaned. So Mika Moon was orphaned and then she was found by this other witch who basically set her up with a bunch of nannies to live on her own and sort of grow up in isolation. And a lot of these witches all live very separately and try not to join up together because the more witches that are in a single place, the more like magic it builds and the more likely they are to be discovered. The book is basically opening up with this very strange group of people asking Mika to come live with them and teach these three young witches how to control their powers. So that group of people includes the love interest Jamie who's like Irish and then we've got the gay couple Ian and Ken. Ken is Japanese and they're like this really old couple. They're like in their 80s. And then we've got the housekeeper Lucy who's just a white woman. But the three girls are orphans from different places. So there's a black girl from London. There's a Vietnamese girl whose family was taken out by a deadly illness. And then finally we have a young girl from Palestine who was under the rubble of a hospital. As you can see, there's like a very diverse cast of characters and this just has me so hyped. Like I didn't know too much about this book going into it, but now knowing that we have this cast of characters, I'm just so excited to see where it goes. And I feel like there's already some themes that I'm like 
starting to catch on that I think are gonna build throughout the book and I feel like I'm gonna really love this one. It's already very like light and whimsical but still has some gravity to it. I also just feel like this is the perfect book to be starting the year with so I'm just very happy about this whole situation. Hello my friends, so I am about 50% through the very secret society of irregular witches. I was listening to the audiobook on my way to work today and during work and on my way back as I was cooking. So I've gotten a decent way through and right now I'm about to do some Discord reading sprints with my Discord community. If you haven't joined already, go join down below. It's completely free and I do reading sprints every now and then whenever I have a free evening and I feel like getting some reading done. So I'm gonna be doing reading sprints for the next I think a couple hours and I'm gonna try to blow through the rest of this book. I really like the audiobook and I'm loving where the story is going. Although the romance isn't as gripping as I was hoping, like it's a very minor part to the entire story I feel like, and it's not the most compelling one that I've read even in terms of like cozy, cutesy romances, but it is cute. Like there have been some nice moments recently in the book that I've been like, yes, I love it. But mainly it's like about this relationship that the main character has with her witchiness, with these young witches and kind of figuring out the mystery of it all. Cause there's a bit of a mystery to it. It's not gonna be a five star, but it's definitely gonna be at least, I think a four. Mika wondered if she was hallucinating. How are you even here? Didn't you and Ken go off on an errand earlier today? He rolled his eyes. Yes, this. This was the errand. He pointed, blinking at the misty windshield. Mika just about made up shape. <laughs> Not like this. Not like this. He seemed to realize what he'd said the same moment she did. Okay, I know I said that I wasn't completely feeling the romance before, but I think I'm feeling it a little bit more now. They're very cute. And one thing that's funny about this book is that although it's like a very lighthearted and like cozy fantasy and very like cutesy fantasy, the characters do reference like lewd things quite often. Like they outright talk about sex at several points in the book and how Ian's trying to match make Jamie and Mika and how Mika is sort of lusting a little bit after Jamie. It's like interesting to see that juxtaposition. Like it's very real, but it's also very like cutesy, I would say, in my opinion at least, but I'm liking this progression of the romance. It just let out the biggest sneeze, but I didn't catch it on camera. I have finished The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. This was so freaking cute. I really enjoyed the second half of the book. The romance does get better. It's still very much that cutesy romance. They say I love you way too fast, but it was still really adorable. And they have just some really fun like exchanges, witty back and forths. And surprisingly, it actually had a full on sex scene, but not anything explicit explicit. It was still very in line with the book's tone since the beginning. At the end of the book, we get a couple twists, two really, really good twists. In my opinion, I really enjoyed them. I feel like they added another level to the book overall because before that it was feeling a little too perfect and like happy-go-lucky. And I do really like the way that the book resolved overall by the end. I feel like we get some really nice character resolution for our main character, Mika. Now, with all that said, I think I would still rate this a four stars. And I think there's a couple reasons why this didn't make it to the full five stars. One is just because this type of book, like, it doesn't hit me in a very strong way in the sense that, like, it didn't make me feel so many things. Yes, it was a lot of fun, but like it didn't make me feel all the things and that's usually the types of books that I rate five stars so that's one reason. Another reason was just like the romance was really cute but like again didn't make me feel too many things. And then the last reason is kind of a minor thing but in the scheme of everything that this book sort of tackled seems like a bit of a thing to me. So this is a spoiler so I'm gonna start the spoiler when it's a spoiler on the screen. Please forward to after the spoiler is done if you do not want to get spoiled. So spoiler starting now. So at the end of the book, we get the whole twist about like Primrose and Lillian being sisters. And throughout the book, there's this like threaded element of Mika feeling a little bit like there's something wrong with the fact that Primrose took her away from her family, from where she was from. She was from India and had her 
grow up isolated. And there's even a moment at like the beginning of the book when she meets the three girls where she's like, why are they all named new things? They definitely had their own, you know, cultural names that they had and Lillian gave them new names so that they wouldn't be discovered and that whole thing. And throughout the book, I just like was waiting for that element to be addressed. This idea of Primrose and Lillian being these like white women saviors who sort of steal these children away from their tragic backgrounds, but also from their different cultures and from a community of people that, you know, they would have related to who they would have seen more of themselves in. There's a part at the end where Rosetta sees like another black witch and she feels that connection and that's great. But like, it's never really addressed the idea that not only were these kids and Mika sort of ripped from having a family, but they were also ripped from their cultures. And I feel like, especially in Mika's case, she didn't grow up with anything South Asian, anything from Indian culture. And none of that really like shines through. She doesn't even end up like rediscovering her background in any way. And I know that like, it doesn't always have to be about all of that, but it just seems a little strange in the scheme of trying to find a home that you wouldn't think about that aspect. I don't know, something about it just didn't sit right with me. And I wanted that element to be Examine. The whole idea of Primrose taking Mika and raising her with these nannies was reminding me a lot of Robin in Babel. The way that Robin is taken from China and brought to, you know, England and brought up in this way that he's sort of ripped away from his culture. Obviously he still learned Chinese at least, but there's this element of him being sort of colonized. I feel like that discussion was missing from this book. I know this is a really fun and like lighthearted book and like we probably don't want to be thinking about this and that's fair. And I think rating this five stars for just like the lovely enjoyment of it is totally valid. I just was bothered by that little fact. I think if we had some sort of few lines or like few paragraphs, just Mika, you know, thinking about this idea of the fact that like, you know, Primrose was being this like white savior woman would have given me that like satisfaction, but we didn't get that. Like there's a few questions here and there, but it's never completely addressed. Anyways, end of spoiler. All that aside, I thought this was really, really fun. And I'm so glad I finally got to reading it. And I completely see why Hannah loved it. So since I'm already in this like sort of cozy fantasy, lighthearted fantasy mood with this book, and since I was listening to the audiobook for this, I feel like I want to listen to another audiobook. So I think I'm going to start Legends and Lattes by Travis Beldry. This one was one of Meg's favorites. So I'm very intrigued and I'm very excited to see what I think of this. This has also just been a favorite of many other booktubers and book talkers that I've seen before for a couple years now, I think. I've been meaning to read it for ages. There's a sequel out. So I'm excited to see what I'm gonna think of this one. So coming in at number two is Legends and Lattes by Travis Bowdry. <laughs> I loved it. This is my first book of the year. I always strive to get a five star. It is just the perfect, low stakes, gentle, cozy book. Oh my God. Hello friends, it's late. I completely forgot that I needed to update this vlog, but I'm about 100 pages in now and I'm really, really liking this. I didn't expect to like it this much, but I am. It's very, very much like low stakes high fantasy. Viv is trying to open her coffee shop, but people don't even know what coffee is because this is a fantasy world and there are like succubi and orcs and gnomes and other shit. There is also a love interest in this book who is the lovely succubi in pink here. Um, and that's Tandri, I think that's her name. And that is turning out to be real cute. Obviously it's like at the very early stages, but I'm already liking the dynamic. And I love Viv as a main character. She's such an unlikely main character. It's very kind of mellow, chill. They're just trying to figure out the business and it's rather adorable. I'm wondering where the rest of the plot is gonna go though for the rest of the book. So yeah, I'm enjoying this. This is like a nice chill read for the beginning of the year, especially now that I'm getting more stressed out with work and all of the things. I finished this last night and honestly, I felt like a really nice fuzzy feeling at the end of this. It was so cozy. It was just really heartwarming and heartfelt. I really loved all of our characters, especially Thimble. I have to say Thimble was my favorite character because he basically says nothing, but he's just so awesome. And just the way he communicates is just 
adorable. But I do feel like the second half of the book dragged a little bit for me in the sense that a lot of the things that were happening felt kind of repetitive. And I think that's just a matter of the fact that this is a low stakes fantasy and you know, they own a coffee shop. So some of it's gonna be repetitive, like they're always making coffee or you know, changing the menu or that kind of thing. But I found that I think I was more invested in the really mundane coffee shop aspects of this book rather than the non-mundane sort of actual plot type things that were going on. This isn't really much of a spoiler, but there's like a threat to the store, to the coffee shop. And that whole aspect, I was just like, I don't care. I wanna hear about the coffee shop. I wanna hear what the new menu item is. Like that's what was going on in my brain. And it was just so interesting to see how I felt about the different aspects of this book because usually I'd be like, oh yeah, I need the plot, da 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 da. But in this one, I was like so highly invested in the plot of whether they were gonna add a new menu item or not, or what they were gonna name the new menu item. I was just deeply in love with the very mundane aspects of this book, and I think that's what made this book for me. I feel like I was expecting a little bit more of a romance. It ended up being a very like minor part of the book, although like the relationship building is obviously a main part of the book, but the actual romancy parts aren't very many, but it was still really freaking cute, and I can see why Meg enjoyed this book because it's just like a little hug. You just can't go Wrong with this like if you're looking for a cozy nice time something that's not gonna hurt your feelings something that's not gonna rip your heart out like this is a book to pick up however we all know that I personally love books that are going to eviscerate me so I would say that I would probably rate this a four stars I think that's the most I would give it in hindsight I really do feel like the very secret society of witches is, is a little bit higher for me I think I would give it a 4.5 but this one is definitely a four just because it doesn't have that extra element the thing that just makes me go, oh my God, this book changed my life. So with that said, we are two books down in the list. The seven year slip I actually posted in, posted in, don't know how to say your last name, should probably look it up, was so fucking charming. And I think, I think if I were really pressed to identify the best book that I read all year, I think it might be this one. Coming in at number six, we have The Seven Year Slip. This book is magical and wonderful and I love it. All right, coming in at number 10 has gotta be The Seven Year Slip. I just really loved everything about this. I had a smile on my face the entire time I was reading this. They just made me feel so giddy and so warm inside. This next book is shockingly I think one of my favorites of the entire year and not because the book is groundbreaking but I love a good heartwarming cozy romantic lighthearted fun time and this book did that for me perfectly The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston Poston? I don't know. I'm about three or four chapters in. This is going pretty well. I am initially not loving it, loving it. It's starting off with our main character who is a senior publicist at this like publishing company in New York City. And that was actually something I didn't know about this book. I didn't know it had a publishing element to it, but I'm getting a sense that the book is setting us up for this idea that, you know, she's this workaholic, yada, 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 thought she wanted this one thing, but at the end of this book, she's gonna realize that she wants more out of life, yada, yada, yada. That is what I'm assuming message of this book is gonna be, which is a totally fine message. I know this book has a time travel element, but I don't know really how, and I believe it has to do with the apartment, but even where I am, I'm like four chapters in. We are just getting to that part. She's met this mysterious man in her apartment. She's like, what the hell is going on? So it shows promise, but I'm not hooked yet. So we'll see. I feel like this book has been hyped a little too hard for me. So there may be a chance that I am highly disappointed. Hello friends, it's a little bit later and I am about 37% into the audiobook for The Seven Year Slip. I'm on chapter 14, I think. And I am starting to enjoy this. It's quite cute. I am loving this idea of the whole seven year slipping thing. So essentially the apartment takes our main character back seven years. So she's meeting the love interest when he is seven years younger, but I'm already calling who he is because they kind of allude to it at the beginning. There's a potential for her to meet him in his like regular age in the present day, but she's obviously imprinted herself in his memory early on. This is giving me a little bit of like time traveler's wife vibes. And then it becomes a discussion of the chicken and the egg, like which came first, like, you know, him falling for her, or her falling for him and all of that. I love the discussion of timing when it comes to romances and how 
if two characters or people didn't meet at a certain time, then the whole trajectory of their lives would be totally different. And also how some romances, some people are not meant to meet or, you know, be together until the timing finally works out. And oftentimes, like, two people keep getting the timing wrong, which leads to very, very sad love stories, which I absolutely love. I have six more hours on the audiobook, but I'm listening to it at double speed, so should be done soon, I think. If I listen to a little bit more before I go to bed, and then I listen to some while I'm doing my makeup in the morning before work, I could finish this very soon. Oh my gosh, the absolute gasp that I let out at the end of chapter 19 of this goddamn book. Oh my god. The way the love interest just just did what he did at the end of chapter 19. Oh my god. It's such a small thing, but I'm like, yes, give me more. I am here for this. Um, needless to say, I'm enjoying this thoroughly. So it's the next day and I have finished The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston. This book, my god guys, as we kept going through the book, I started to like this a lot more. And I just started to get all of those fun, romancy feels as I was going through it. And the love interest was just saying some things that were just, you know, getting me so hyped for this romance. There was a lot of parts where he would just like call her by her name and it was just like so freaking hot and sexy and I was just like, yes, please give me more. And overall, it just progressed in a really cute, adorable way. This book doesn't have many spicy scenes. There's like maybe one that's like more explicit, but even then it's not really focused on the spicy scenes and I'm kind of okay with that. I really enjoyed just the wholesome, adorable nature of this book and also just the different ideas of what you want out of life and out of a career and how you find value in the things that you do in your life. I definitely called the ending of the book, especially to do with the main characters like character arc but regardless I still really enjoyed the journey and I really loved seeing the main character interact with both the like seven years ago version of the love interest and also the current version I did want a little bit more out of their relationship in the current timeline I feel like we could have gotten a few more scenes or something to make that bond a little bit stronger but I still really enjoyed what we did get I think in another universe there would be a slightly darker version of this book that would be a lot more heartbreaking, I think, and that would be the book that I would rate five stars. Whereas this, while I absolutely adored it, I think I would rate closer to a 4.5 stars. And one of the reasons why it's not just a four is because of the discussion of grief. At the end of the book and at the end of the audiobook, there's an author's note where the author explains that the whole, you know, death of the aunt storyline in this book is based off of her grandfather's death, who, this is a spoiler, so skip to when spoiler is off the screen, who also died by suicide, similar to the main character's aunt in this book. And that detail added some dimension to this book because I think the element of the aunt dying by suicide in this book took me by surprise. It definitely felt like a bit of a twist and it was obviously super heartbreaking, but I think seeing the main character deal with the grief related to that was just so heartbreaking and felt so real. And obviously everyone goes through grief in a different way. The way we think about people who have died by suicide varies across people, but I think this was handled with such beauty and grace and care and just love, really. You know, you can love a person immensely in life and, you know, still kind of hate them for the decisions that they make at the end of life, but still love them regardless. And obviously they've been struggling significantly and a lot of this is not really their fault even. And so we can know all that, but still feel, you know, this tension of emotions when it comes to the grief that we have for them. I absolutely loved particularly the scene where the main character meets her aunt's like long lost love, Vera. And it was kind of a cute little tidbit that Vera ended up being the mother of the love interest. But aside from that, that whole scene with Vera and you know, telling her about the aunt's death and hearing her talk about her with love and hearing how they were writing these letters to each other for years, like that was just such a beautiful scene. And also just the way that the main character leaves that moment and also comes to term with like 
her feelings about her aunt's death by the end of the book like that was just so beautiful to me i really loved it like i felt like crying by the end and overall i liked that it added this dimension to this otherwise fairly light-hearted book but yeah those are my thoughts on this one i really really enjoyed it i can see why so many people had it on their top 10 list. I still feel like there's a version of this book that could be out there of this concept that could be a little bit more heartbreaking and really delve more into the time travel aspect and like the idea of regret and the idea of the love interest falling in love with her so many years ago but her, you know, having this all happen in a very short timeline, like those aspects of the book, I feel it could have been explored a little bit more, but I'm so very happy with what this book did on its own and the discussions of grief. So yeah, very enjoyable read, and I'm so glad that we are still on a pretty good streak for this video, and we still haven't hit anything lower than a four stars, so I'm feeling very optimistic. None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. This is her new release of 2023. She has tons of thriller books, and I've read another one of them and absolutely hated it, and this one I absolutely love and you just start following these two women secrets come out things get weirder and weirder and weirder and the second you think you're starting to understand you actually don't and I loved it this is my favorite thriller of the year by far none of this is true this book was so surprising and so juicy and exactly what I needed at the exact time that I read it it's so twisted it's so juicy it's so good I would really recommend it because I think this is a mystery thriller that feels different than anything I've ever read before so I highly recommend it <laughs> So next up, I've started None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. I started this on my walk home from work. I'm listening to the audiobook and I have to say the audiobook is fantastic. It's narrated by multiple people. There's an element of one of the characters being a podcaster and so the podcast elements are like woven through and so you're getting different voices for the podcast parts and you're also getting different narrators for the two different main characters. I'm very early into this book like I'm only two or three chapters in so I don't have many thoughts but highly recommend the audiobook if you are gonna pick this up. Okay so I am about 120 pages into none of this is true and I am really really enjoying this. I'm not usually a mystery thriller reader but this feels like crack. I just want to keep reading and I probably am going to keep reading a little bit more tonight but I just wanted to give you guys a sense of what the book is about. Essentially we have these two women Josie and Alex. Alex is this like podcast host woman who interviews all these successful women and all of their like trying journeys to success. And she's having some problems with her husband who has a drinking problem, but otherwise her life is quite picture perfect. And then we have Josie. Josie is this very like unsuspecting, sort of boring woman you would initially think. But she's married to a man who is a few decades older than her and she's got some weird things going on at home. And she basically approaches Alex with the idea that Alex could make a podcast about her and her life and her past and her trying to change her life. And the way that these two meet is on their birthdays because they happen to be birthday twins. They were both born at the same hospital. And so they both meet at the restaurant that they were having dinner at on their birthdays. So that's basically the premise of this book. And it's honestly really, really interesting. Like I didn't know what I was expecting with it but there's obviously like more to the mystery with Josie and I feel like things are gonna go off the rails at some point. Another element to this is that in between like chapters and whatever we get bits and pieces of this Netflix documentary about Josie and Alex and this whole situation and there's mention of some murders. This is showing a lot more promise than a lot of other mystery thrillers I've read before. So I feel like this could continue our four star and above streak. Who knows? I really hope I didn't just jinx it. Okay, so I am 70 pages from the end of None of This Is True and 
I am like being taken for a ride, guys. Like this is so good. I see why this was on so many people's favorites list because it's just like hooked me. I love the audiobook, as I said earlier. Like the audiobook is just narrated so well and it has all these sound effects and music and so it really adds to the experience but the story is just starting to go off the rails like we've reached the point where everything is being turned on its head and we're learning a lot more about the characters and now you're just trying to figure out like what's actually going on we have some very shady unreliable narrators in this book and it's overall just providing a really interesting and thrilling experience honestly i'm just enjoying this so much far more than than I actually expected to and I'm incredibly curious to see what's gonna happen at the end because there's so much that has happened and I just want to know I just need to know so I have about an hour left of the audiobook so I'm probably gonna try and finish that tonight and then I'll let you know my thoughts at the end but right now given everything that we have so far it's looking like a solid four stars but who knows maybe the ending will be shit and then I'll be like ah oh, this is like a two or three <laughs> So I have at last finished None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell and oh my god guys, this was so fucking good. I just finished listening to the audiobook this morning on my way back from the gym and that ending? That ending? Like what? I absolutely love the ending of this book and I love that it's an ambiguous one and it leaves a lot of questions and like the title suggests none of it is true but you also don't know who to believe there's multiple characters who are telling you know their side of the story but you don't know who is actually telling the truth which makes for a very compelling read i just enjoyed this so much it was so addictive it was really interesting all the characters are kind of unreliable narrators and i also loved the growth that we get in alex's character now this is just making me want to read another lisa jewel book and see if maybe i am a mystery thriller girly maybe i do enjoy them maybe i just haven't found the right ones up until this point who knows maybe i'll be in my mystery thriller era this year one thing that i found that was interesting is that the back the book has a blurb from Emily Henry for this book and she says if you liked Verity by Colleen Hoover I think you'll love this one twisty 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 um, and I kind of agree with that like if you did like Verity by Colleen Hoover you'll probably enjoy this because the characters are very unreliable like the main characters in Verity and your perspective shifts on these women and there's all this like creepy mess up shit going on and overall it's just so intriguing like you just want to know more the whole thing was just so dark and messed up and I just enjoyed it so much. It felt like some of my favorite like CSI episodes or something from when I was a kid because I used to be obsessed with that show. So yeah, really, really happy with this one. Like highly recommend. I think this one is gonna be a 4.5, maybe even a five star. Like that was not one I expected to be a five, but I think like in terms of how it's hit me, it hasn't hit me in like a massive way, like I don't think this book has changed my life, but I do think in terms of a mystery thriller, this is so fucking well done. Like I think in that sense, it's a five star book, it's a five star mystery thriller, even if it's not like one of my favorite books ever. Though I can see this like contending for potentially a top 10 spot this year, who knows? Wow. This video's going so well. I'm so happy. It's honestly not even really a thriller. When you look at it on a surface level, it seems like it would be because it's inspired by the real life sorority murders that happened by a very famous American serial killer. Ugh, this book is so good. Maybe I should put it higher on my list. Honestly, these rankings are arbitrary. All of the books here are good. I wasn't expecting to love this as much as I was. When the top 10 list came out, I was excited to read this. I already owned it. So I was excited for it, but I wasn't like, predicting it was gonna be a five star. I was probably thinking, oh, it's gonna be a really good four star, you know? But my gosh, my gosh, guys, this book is so, 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 so good. Up, I'm gonna pick up Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll, which was a favorite of Cindy and Meg's. So this will be the second book I'm reading of Meg's favorites and the first of Cindy's favorites. There is also an audiobook, which I'm probably gonna listen to. I'm really excited for this one because I feel like I'm already in the mystery thriller mood from None of This Is True, and I feel like this is gonna scratch a similar itch. All I really know about this one is that it's sort of following the women targeted by Ted Bundy back in the 70s, 80s, and it's following two different women 
and it's kind of like their solidarity with each other and focuses more on the women rather than him as a serial killer, which I think is a refreshing take. So I'm excited to see what I think of this one. Wish me luck. This is a pretty short-ish book as well. Okay, never mind. It's like 364 pages, but the audiobook isn't very long. It's only like six hours. So I feel like I can probably get through this today. So here's hoping that it's another four stars and above. We're having a really good streak here and I don't want to break it. I swear if we end up with all above four stars for this entire video, I'm gonna like lose my shit because that's insane. All right, so I'm about 80 pages into Bright Young Woman and I'm enjoying this quite a bit. This is basically a fictional account of Ted Bundy's attack on this sorority house in Florida in the 1970s. And so we are taking the perspective of the head of the sorority house, Pamela, and she's sort of describing the events of that night. And she was the only one who happened to see him as he was escaping. But from there, the story kind of expands actually. There are perspectives from some of the other women in the story and the other victims. And I'm really curious to see how this is gonna all unfold and how much of the trials it's gonna cover as well. But one thing I'm already really, really loving about this book is that they do not name Ted Bundy in the book. Throughout the book, he's only referred to as the defendant or the man so that he's not given this like larger than life quality. And so that the story isn't really about him and it's about the women, which I'm really liking so far. So I'm curious to see where this is gonna go. I am struggling a little bit to keep all the details straight in my mind, also because I was listening to the audiobook when I started this, but I'm gonna try following along on the physical copy as I read the rest and then I'll let you know what I think. I have gotten further into Bright Young Woman. I do feel like I've been dragging my feet on this one because I'm not enjoying it quite as much as some of the earlier books on this video. At the moment I'm about two-thirds into the book and it's starting to get a little bit better. There was a point in like the early middle where I was honestly just getting so confused by all of the details and the shifting perspectives. We are shifting between three different perspectives. So there's Pamela in current day, I think like 2021, and then Pamela in the past when the sorority house was attacked in the 70s. And then we also have Ruth from earlier in the 70s as well. And in both of these 70s timelines, there is one character that is like in both of those stories and her name's Tina. The fact that she shows up in both is kind of confusing, I think, as I've been reading because I forget if I'm in like Pamela's perspective or Ruth's perspective sometimes, um, especially with the audiobook. This might just be me and I feel like following along with the book in the recent chapters has helped a lot. But regardless, I feel like Ruth's perspective, I'm not enjoying as much or I'm not seeing as much of the value in it the same way I see Pamela's part of the story because Pamela's part of the story, like she's actively trying to figure out, you know, what happened and if they can catch the person who attacked the sorority house. And so that part has me intrigued and I like want to know what's going to happen next. But with Ruth, I feel like we kind of know how her story is going to end. And so the lead up to it isn't as interesting to me, I guess, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I have about one third left of this book, so I'm hoping to finish it today so that I can get started on another book for this vlog. Today is January 13th, so we're about halfway through the month and I have gotten through four books and then with Bright Young Woman, I'll have gotten through five. So I have finished Bright Young Woman by Jessica Knoll and oh my God, guys, like <laughs> this book. I just wanna cry, I wanna scream, I wanna throw up. Like, this book, oh my god. I loved it, I loved it. I know I was very skeptical of this book at the beginning and I wasn't really enjoying it up until like third or like halfway through, but oh my god, the second half just really brings the book together. And we learn so much about the characters. The situation just like gets more and more tense and suspenseful and I got to the end of the book and I just wanted to cry, especially if you've read the book, like the last scene with Ruth, I just was so torn and just so saddened, I think. This book was just incredible. I see now why Cindy and Meg both recommended this and had it on their top 10 list. There's something so important that this book conveys. And although I was confused by the format of the book and by all of the details that were given, there's so many details. I think by the end, it all sort of comes together and you see the humanity of these girls and how it wasn't that Ted Bundy was like this amazing, good looking, super smart, 
charming guy. It was just that the police, the detectives, the law enforcement, like all of them were just so incompetent and all of them were happy to idolize a serial killer, a man, rather than believe women. And you know, it's just this wild, wild thing. Like it all kind of comes together and I just, I'm just shook it. Essentially this book just argues the fact that all of these documentaries and all of these biographies and all of these true crime books, like they idolize Ted Bundy. They make him out to be such a smart, suave, charming, handsome guy who was so brilliant and pulled off these crimes and escaped and all of this, when in fact he was just a regular, pathetic incel guy. It's not that he was skilled, but that, you know, all of this law enforcement was incompetent. They refused to believe these women. They refused to see the signs when they were right in front of them. And they refused to properly protect these women. I think Ruth's storyline, while initially I wasn't completely understanding why it was included. By the time we got to the midpoint and by the time we got to the end, I really started to understand why we were hearing from her. And I love that this book takes the perspective of the victims and takes the perspective of the women, these bright young women who were snuffed out early in their lives and who were trying their hardest to put this awful man behind bars. All of these men around them were continuously infantilizing them and not believing them and dismissing them. Yeah, this whole book was just like so frustrating to read at some points because, you know, there are moments that you recognize, you know, in real life now that like, oh my God, like this still happens and it's so frustrating. I feel like I don't have the words to properly express how much I love this and how smart and brilliant this book is it provides such a complex portrayal of all of these women not only the victims and you know pamela who's trying to figure out this mystery but also like tina and ruth's mother and pamela's mother and all of the other you know women around them and denise i think the element of carl's story in this book was what really drove the argument you know home because he switches his tone to feed the public what they want and starts to sensationalize and idolize Ted Bundy, because it's easy for men to believe that this serial killer, this man was a brilliant person rather than believe that they were incompetent in stopping him and that these women never wanted to, you know, be put in these positions. They never necessarily wanted to follow him because he was good looking or, you know, that he was charming. They were just being kind and doing what women have been told they need to do their entire lives. They need to be kind. They need to, you know, say yes. They always need to smile. Yeah, that element just, yeah, hit, hit. Yeah, so if you're gonna read this, I highly recommend looking at the triggers, but oh my God, this is incredible. And I don't know how the other books are gonna follow up to this. I think if I had to rate this right now, I'm thinking a 4.5 but I may even round it up to a five because yeah, the second half of this book really made it. And actually now that I've finished it, I really want to reread the entire book because I feel like there's so many details that I was missing at the beginning and that I wish I'd paid more attention to. All right, I think that's all I can put together at this moment in time. Woman Eating. You all know I love this book. Favorite lit fic book I have read. It's phenomenal. It's everything I could ever ask for. It's dark, it's kind of gothic and gruesome and violent, but it's also, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again, this is for the vampire girlies with mommy issues and eating disorders. That's who this book was made for and it's, oh my god, I eat it up, pun intended. Good morning, friends. I have started Women Eating by Claire Coda, and I am loving this. I'm about 50 pages in, about two chapters. So far, we've been introduced to our main character, who is Lydia, and she's essentially a vampire. She is 23. Her mother was turned into a vampire at some point in her life, and her mother, after giving birth to Lydia, turned her into a vampire a few days after her birth. So our main character has grown up to her full physical body and she won't be, you know, aging more than that. But when we're meeting her in the book, she is 
on this new journey. She has left her mother behind. She's trying to adult. She's also trying to figure out how to deal with all of her vampire-ness in this new life. And she also happens to be a performance artist, which is an interesting aspect to this. This is giving very literary vibes, which I was expecting. And I feel like I'm just enjoying hearing about this character and following her, even though not much is happening. I'm curious to see where the book is gonna go by the end, because right now it just seems like she's just adjusting to life. And that's basically the story, but maybe there's more to it. The book is only about 220, 30 pages. So I'm about 50 pages in. So I feel like I can probably finish this in one day today. It's before work right now. I just got back from the gym and I was listening to this on my way to the gym and back. And now I'm gonna start work, but I think I'll probably finish this after work while I'm having dinner. And also while I have my live show with my bindery community later tonight, it's like a fun monthly Zoom hangout that I'm doing with my bindery community. So if you are interested in getting perks like that and getting to do these monthly hangouts with me on Zoom, definitely go check out my bindery down below and sign up. There's a lot of exclusive perks beyond that too. You get like my monthly TBRs, you get progress updates on my vlogs, and you get journal updates from me. With that said, I'm excited to see where this goes. I feel like I'm just on this like women bend right now and I am here for it. I'm enjoying it. So we'll see how this goes. So it's a lot later. I am about 50 pages from the end of Woman Eating and I don't know how I feel about this now. <laughs> While I initially liked the tone of things and the writing, as we get further into the middle of the book, not much is going on. And I do feel like the book is more of a vibes book than a plot book, which makes sense to me. I know Hannah enjoyed The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chokshi, whereas I absolutely did not. And that book is also one that has a lot of vibes, no plot. There are some things that are happening in this book, like our main character is trying to figure out where she can get blood. Blood. She's dealing with this guy at the studio who she may have a thing with. And she's also dealing with the man where she's interning at, I think. And he is like a creep. He gropes her at one point and it's a whole thing. But I feel like most of the book is happening inside her head. Like a lot of it is her internal dialogue and her thoughts and how she's dealing with all of this. And on the one hand, it's like relatable in some ways. And it's like interesting to just think about the logistics of being a vampire. But I do feel like there is a lot of like literary metaphors and imagery at work, which I feel like I am not completely getting or caring for. There is a point though, where the main characters are talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I'm like, yes, like I'm here for the Buffy content. So that was kind of fun. But I have reached part three of the book. The book is only like 230 pages. So each section isn't very long, but I'm on part three and main character has made some questionable decisions. So I feel like this is the part of the book where shit is gonna hit the fan, but I'm still sort of struggling to see the overall plot of this book or point, I guess. Feel like I want more from it, but maybe the ending will be really cool. Who knows? I do feel like this is more of those like vibey books and it did have some really great lines. Like I did tab a few lines. So I agree that the writing for this is beautiful and sort of the questions that it examines are also interesting. It talks about desire and cravings, goodness versus evil. Like the main character has this notion of the vampire part of her is a monster and then there's the human part of her. And this is informed by her mother own views of how she feels about being a vampire. I feel like this is just one of those books that's gonna be really weird and have a batshit crazy ending. And while I see the value in that sometimes, I'm just not really one of those people who typically enjoys books like that. So we'll see if the last 50 pages change my mind. Okay, I have finally finished Woman Eating. I was reading this while I was doing reading sprints with my bindery members tonight. I had a really nice chat with one of them named Sarah. Shout out to you. Sarah had a lovely evening with you and yeah we chatted we did some reading sprints and I got to like the very ending of this book I had like two pages left so I just finished that up after the zoom hangout and I don't know how to feel about this book it was so freaking weird like it just kept getting weirder there's a lot of like dreams and weird situations and confusion that the main character is feeling one aspect that I haven't talked about that I completely forgot to was that the main character is mixed race she's half Japanese but her mother is half Malaysian and half British and there's an aspect of the idea of this vampiric hunger also taking the form of the main character wanting to be able to 
taste these different cuisines and kind of discover her heritage through food. She watches these like what I eat in a day or what I eat in a week videos on YouTube and like on social media. And she's thinking about how she may have been able to connect with her father and like, you know, his heritage a little bit more had she been able to eat and consume these foods. And it's just interesting, I guess, like I liked a lot of the themes that this book was like pulling up, but I just wanted them to be explored in like a deeper way and also with a more interesting plot. Like I didn't really care for this insular world that she is sort of in. There's very few characters and something about it just didn't feel completely fleshed out. Like this is a very short book and it's like almost to me like a novella. A lot of the plot points and themes aren't completely fleshed out and I feel like it should have been longer and should have had more meat to it, I guess. The little bit of plot that we do get, one of the major things actually happens in like the last 15 pages of the book, which is actually so insane to me because we were like, you know, on our Zoom hangout and I had like 15 pages left and I was like, who knows, maybe something will happen in these last 15 pages and then it does. But I wanted that to happen like sooner and I wanted to see, I guess, more of the aftermath of that decision that she takes. But maybe, you know, that wasn't the point of this book. I feel like this book was more exploring the mixed race heritage, this idea of the main character accepting her vampiric self. In terms of the vampire aspect of this book, it just wasn't as interesting or fun as other vampire books that I've read. There's so much that can be discussed with vampires, not only the aspect of hunger, gluttony, lust, but also this immortal life. And like she touches on that a lot, but it's like, I don't know, it doesn't have that much gravity because she's like 23 years old and she's only lived this like short life. So she doesn't have any of that gravity. Like I feel like a lot of the vampire books that I do enjoy involve some of that like older vampire characters that add a level of gravity to the whole situation and how you know this endless life is in some ways incredible but in some ways so very lonely and hard. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this book. We were on such a good streak and now I don't know what to do. Like I can't believe that this was the book that ruined the streak. I'm actually so sad. I think right now if I had to rate it it would probably be a 3.5 stars, maybe 3.75, but nothing more than that. So now I'm kind of trying to decide what to read next because I feel like I just subconsciously ended up picking up all the books that I wanted to read more first and now I've left myself with the ones that I may not like and now I'm a little anxious because after not enjoying woman eating all that much, I'm a little worried. I can't believe I committed to this many books. This was unhinged. Study in Drowning. This is the first young adult dark academia book that I actually enjoyed. I was so convinced for the longest time that I was gonna rate this three stars because it was so slow and I was getting kind of bored with it. But then the last one third, it just really brought everything all together. And I kept on thinking, shit, this author really pulled off a good job here. A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed. Absolutely love this book. Cannot recommend it enough if you still haven't read it. You definitely should. You won't regret it. My apologies for this horrible angle, but I put away all of my filming equipment because some of my friends are coming over for lunch. But I am about over 50% through a study in drowning. I don't know how I feel about this. Initially, I wasn't really feeling it. I forgot to do an update, it's been a few days. I wasn't really loving the main character. I found her to be slightly annoying, which I mean, it's not her fault, but she was annoying. And I didn't really like the way that she was treating the love interest, who is this guy from a different like country in this fantasy world. And it's actually the country that's being like colonized by her country. So I just wasn't really feeling the way that she was holding his background against him. But where I am now, she's like sort of gotten over that. And she was just kind of reacting out of, you know, stereotypes and what she's familiar with. And also out of her own like insecurities. And I think that's why I don't like her as much. Like she has a lot of insecurities and she's very like anxious. And so that comes across in like her relationships and the way she acts around people. Like she gets really defensive at many points in the book, which was slightly frustrating at some point because I just wanted her to get it together or just understand that the person she's talking to isn't necessarily like after her. Another thing I'm not completely loving is that there's an element in this book that our main character, she is from this architecture college. She actually wanted to be in the literature college, but women are not allowed in the literature college. So she's the only woman in the architecture college. And like, there's this element of, you know, sexual assaults and just unwanted attention from the men around her. And it's like happening to be most of the men that she's around all give her unwanted attention. And then there's also an element of like her advisor or something actually assaulting 
leaving her and her having to just deal with it. And that part, like I understand, you know, that idea of like her feeling like she's drowning, like all of that representation is great. But one of the things that I'm annoyed with is that at this point, like the only man who does not give her unwanted attention is the love interest. And so it just makes me wonder whether like she's latching onto him, not because she actually likes him, but because he's the only person who's actually treated her like a person, you know? But regardless, like I am starting to see some of the romancy bits, like I wasn't really feeling it at the beginning, but now I'm starting to feel it a little bit more. They have some shared interests. They both really like literature and like often quote things, which is like kind of cute. And now they're sort of working together to uncover this mystery, which is kind of fun and I'm enjoying that. But I'm curious to see like where this is gonna land. And then the last thing, which is the main reason why I want to read this book was because the author had done this post about how this book she got to talk about mental illness and you know mental health in a bigger way than her other books that intrigued me a lot because as you guys know mental illness and so i wanted to see that aspect and it's actually a very strong aspect to this book but it's also kind of tied in with the fantasy element of this book so it's kind of hard to tell whether in the end it's going to actually be a mental illness or if it's like an actual fantasy thing i don't know i feel like i want it in the end to be an actual mental illness to actually have this representation in a fantasy book but i also can see how it would be very devastating for the main character to actually come to terms with the fact that it may only just be a mental illness. Um, there's like parts of the book where she's like popping sleeping pills and these other pills that are supposed to stop her visions, but there's an element of them not working and her feeling like everyone's just thinking she's crazy, but she's actually just seeing this real thing that's like a fantasy element. So I'm just curious to see how that's gonna be handled in the end. When I was in the 20% in, I feel like I didn't really like this and I probably would have rated it really low. But now that I'm like over halfway through, I'm liking it more, but I still don't think it's gonna be up there. But we'll see. Okay, so I've finished A Steady and Drowning and I have so many thoughts and I don't know how to pull them all together because on the one hand, I really loved all of the themes that this book explored. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that I loved the execution. But this is not to say that I didn't love it overall. So one of the main things that this book delves into is the idea of sexual assault, of sexism in academia, and of women being told that they're frivolous and hysterical and not being believed. It also has an element of like mentioned grooming and of romanticizing toxic relationships. And overall, I really appreciated all of those aspects but I just don't know that I love the way that they were handled. I feel like at the end of this book, everything felt a little too easy and a little too wrapped up. And I feel like all of these things are things that give a person lasting trauma. And it's not an element of just defeating the villain. It's also an element of constantly living with that trauma every day and constantly being reminded of it. I did like all of like the spooky, eerie, dark academia elements of this book. I really love the mystery and how we're trying to figure out who really authored this amazing book. And the romance did grow on me, but I still stand by this whole situation of him being the only man in that entire story that wasn't trying to assault her or use her. Like he was the one person who treated her like an actual human being. And I don't think that necessarily justifies him to be like that incredible. Like he's just a man. He is just a mediocre man. Yes, he does some lovely, sweet things, but I mean, he was the only person doing those things. So I feel like she didn't really have a frame of reference when it came to who she was falling in love with. I'm not saying that I don't love Preston as a character. I think he was really sweet. I think he really stuck to his guns and he did what he said he was gonna do and I appreciated all of that. But regardless, something about it just felt weird to me that he was the only man that had treated her well. Um, and he also happened to be the love interest. Another aspect to this entire book is that it's a book about feminism, it's about all the things that women go through and how they are constantly dismissed. And I just feel like there wasn't enough women in this book the way I wanted. There's like two major female characters, but the rest are all men who are trying to use Effie, essentially. And then there's Preston. I wanted our second major female character to have more screen time. She kind of comes in at the end. I'm trying not to spoil things for you guys, but she kind of comes in towards the end and we hear more from her. But I just really wish that that aspect had been fleshed out earlier and that Effie had been given that solidarity earlier. But I understand it was also part of the mystery. So like, 
yeah. I feel like one element to my complicated feelings about this is that it is a YA, so there's only so much, I think, that could have been explored in this book. At times I was feeling like there were parts of this book that just didn't seem like they should be in a YA book, and I didn't necessarily feel that a teen, or like me when I was like 13, 14, or 15, would have understood all of what goes on in this book. Maybe I'm not giving enough credit to teens these days, but I feel like knowing how I was as a young teen, like I would have been totally romanticizing a lot of the toxic things in this and, you know, kind of romanticizing the fairy king the way that Effie does when she initially read Ang Harid. And there's an element of her like believing that it was supposed to be a romance um, and that it is a romance, but, you know, realizing that, oh wait, no, it's actually also not. I don't know. I feel like if this had been an adult novel and we had been able to flesh out more of the feminist aspects of the book rather than focusing on the romance, I would have loved that. I think that's actually what bothers me. While I loved the romance and I thought it was really cute and awkward and funny and adorable, I do wish that it wasn't like the major focus of the book and I do wish that we had spent more time, I don't know, with Effie and just her character development and other aspects of the book and that we had had more women in the book. I feel like the romance just ended up overshadowing a lot of the important and incredible things this book was trying to do. I think also after like reading Bright Young Women earlier in this vlog, I think that was such a well done feminist novel and I couldn't help but comparing in some ways like aspects of this and how it focuses so much on the men. You know, it centers so many of the men in this when it really is about the women. And I know like she's dealing with all of this sexism and that we're trying to portray that, but I also feel like I wanted more with the women in this book. I know I didn't love Effie at the beginning, but by the end of the book, I really did start to like her a lot more. And I really empathized and understood the element of being a survivor and how that is what was just propelling her forward this entire book. I think if you're going into this book, like just be mindful of content warnings and triggers because I was triggered by this book, I think for the most part. And I think that's also why like the element of reading it wasn't as nice as it might have been for other people. And it was also why I just couldn't like focus on this romance as much as one would hope. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Very jumbled and all over the place and I don't know what to feel, but we've finished another book for this vlog and I still feel like that one is gonna be four-ish stars for me. This is very exciting, but I think my third favorite book that I've read this year has got to be The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. And this is definitely without a doubt my favorite thriller that I read this year. I know I'm probably getting a lot of side eyes because there's a lot of people who really don't like this book, but this book, it feels like one of those books that was written just for me. My next one is controversial. I told you guys this was going to be here, but did you think it was going to be this high up? But number three is The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. <laughs> That's my opinion! Okay, I know a lot of people haven't liked this, but you're wrong. <laughs> okay, so yesterday I started the writing retreat by Julia Bartz and I'm about halfway through already. I've been listening to the audiobook. I listened to a bunch of it last night and then I listened to a bit of it this morning as well and during my off times in work. And overall, I'm not sure how I feel about this one. The premise is really interesting. Essentially, it involves these like five different women who are brought together by this famous author and they are essentially on a writing retreat with her. And at the end of the retreat, whoever has the best story will end up with a $1 million advance for a book deal and they'll get published published within that year. Where we're actually entering the story from is from the perspective of Alex, who has recently had a falling out in the past year with her best friend, Ren, and there's a really complicated relationship there. And the two of them actually end up at the writing retreat through some unlikely circumstances. Both of them were obsessed with this author who's running the retreat, Rosa Ballo, and she is known for some of her eccentricities and also for writing these really sort of unhinged books. And so while the concept seems super interesting, I'm not sure that I'm loving where it's going. I feel like we're only halfway through, so I don't know where everything's gonna end up. I'm also not sure if some parts of the book are supernatural or if there's a actual physical explanation for them. And while I like 
the mystery and I like the characters that we have to play with. I do feel like it's not as compelling as say none of this was true which I read earlier in this vlog and which I absolutely adored. I feel like in that book the characters because there was only two of them they were so much more vivid to me and personally I just don't feel like I like the narrator of this book which is Alex. She's a very sort of anxious character and, and she's someone you can't really trust. She seems like an unreliable narrator but like in a way where she doesn't know she's unreliable and she seems to have these weird obsessions and she seems to get very defensive about things which is like slightly annoying but one thing I am liking is the queer undertones to this book. There's an element of some attraction between several of the characters and we're trying to figure out sort of what's really going on and how these characters really feel. And where I'm at in the book we have passed the midpoint where shit sort of hits the fan and the premise sort of takes a different turn and essentially the stakes get higher and there's some more panic ensuing. Although we've gone to this midpoint, I'm not sure that I love what happened with the midpoint and where it's going now. I think I like the initial parts better, but I'm curious to see where it's gonna go. I feel like this one could be a hit or miss depending on how the last like 40% goes because I feel like if it goes in one direction, I'll likely hate it. And if it goes in another direction, then I might be mildly interested, but I don't really see this going in a direction where I'm gonna love it by the end, but who knows? We'll see, I might get surprised. But overall, this is like one of those thrillers that just reminds me why I don't actually like thrillers all that much or why I don't pick them up that often, because I feel like if the twists aren't insanely good, then I am just unimpressed when it comes to thrillers. Whereas with other books, I feel like there's so many other elements that can still keep me going and still keep my interest, even if like the twists aren't it. Anyways, those are my initial thoughts. So we'll see how this goes. I do like the writing aspects and like that element to the book and it's just making me want to get back into writing, but you know, that's a lot of work. So we'll see. Hello friends. So I have finished the writing retreat and I'm sorry, but this is like a two stars for me. This was probably the worst book of this entire video. I'm calling it now. Even based off of the future books, I feel like this is gonna be my least favorite. I'm so sorry to Meg and Gabby. Please don't listen to this because I know you guys like this book. So yeah, just skip this part of the video. Yeah, this book just wasn't it for me. I was saying in the earlier clip that, you know, if it went this one way, I would probably hate it. And it went in exactly that direction. Like it went in the very predictable direction that I had already kind of guessed. And so when it actually happened, I was like, no. And then from there, I was just like, okay, there's gotta be some other twist. There's gotta be something extra, something more interesting to this story, something that's gonna really flip this on its head. I need another plot twist because this is a thriller and I wanna be like on my toes. And although this was like thrilling towards the end and I was like, you know, oh, what's gonna happen to the characters, whatever, I still feel like that was just secondary to me wanting like something more out of this story. Like I really expected more out of it, especially because of the way that the book starts with our main character, Alex, and like this complicated relationship with her friend, Ren. I feel like nothing actually actually came out of that complicated relationship. They sort of reconnect later in the book, but like I was expecting some sort of thrilling aspect. Like it made it seem as if Alex had done something crazy horrible to Ren and that she was actually hiding something. And I was waiting for this secret to drop, but all the secrets that actually ended up dropping were just related to the character's sexuality, which was like something I called from the beginning and which is something you probably would have called from like the very first mentions of the extra things going on in their relationship. I feel like I just wanted so much more out of this book. Like it had such a fun premise and I feel like it could have gone in so many directions, but it just ended up being sort of this overly dramatic and just off the rails thriller that didn't really add anything to my experience, I feel like. I was also kind of in my mind comparing this to None of This Is True, which was the other thriller that I read for this video. I feel like that book is just the type of thriller that I actually enjoy, where it's a mystery, there are some thrilling parts to it, but there are so many added twists and turns and things that we're learning about the characters and it's just so intricately plotted and we're just like trying to zone in on these small little details that really lead to something bigger. Whereas this book was just, not much of that. It was just like a very linear storyline and it had a very obvious turn of events. And I feel like I was just calling all of the twists each time. And so when they happened, I was like, okay, yeah, tell me more. I'm gonna go into spoilers for a really quick bit for those of you who have read this book. So just wait until the word spoilers is off the screen here. But 
The whole part where we find out that Rosa is like killing, you know, these women and taking their stories, like I called that from the beginning. The second we find out about her friend who like died young and how she had this book that really tanked, but the rest of them did really well. I was like, immediately she's taking other people's work. At least that, and I was like, maybe she's killing them, but who knows. And then the other thing I called was that she was planning to steal all of their stories from the retreat. Like that was super obvious. And then the twist at the end where Kira comes back and has actually survived, I was also calling that because I was like, there's no way this author killed off the one black character in this book. And I was also just like, you know, it would be stupid if she died at this point and how else are they all gonna get out of this? I think what I wanted more out of the book was something from the ending. Like I thought there was gonna be some sort of sinister ending to this where there's something we learned about Alex that's like really bad. And although we have like the semi element of her being like kind of happy that she gets contacted by Rosa, like I feel like that just wasn't enough. Like she has this happy ending at the end and like, you know, they all have this trauma and they're walking away from it. But like even the Ren relationship didn't do much for me, especially where it ended at the end. And the fact that Rosa gets away was kind of not satisfying either. Not even in the, oh, I wonder what she's up to because we don't even get a hint of what she might be up to. What is she out there doing? She has some wealth to her, but like she's not writing anymore. She's not stealing other people's books. Is she gonna come alive in a different form? You know, is she gonna take another name, another identity? Like that would have been a cool thing. And I feel like our main character was just so messed up and she was just one of those characters who was like so self-pitying and like self-victimizing that it was just so frustrating to read from her and I feel like I wanted her in the end to be like a bad character or like have some secret motive or like some secret twist to her that would make her more interesting because she was just so annoying to me. Those are my major thoughts on all the things that I didn't like that are kind of spoilers but if you guys have any others let me know down below. Put the word spoiler before you get into your spoiler but I just really want to know what other people thought of some of these elements because yeah it was just hurting me. So overall, this was just the bust of this video, I feel like. I'm so sad about that because, yeah, I was hoping that I would be getting into my thriller era, but maybe I need to choose my thrillers very carefully because none of this is true. It was just so freaking fantastic. But I've learned that thrillers like this one are just not my thing. Anyways, those are all my thoughts on this. I am going to cleanse my palette now with a romance book that's unrelated to this video and then I'm gonna come back for the last four books of this video. This is just one of the best books I've read and I again think more people need to read this book and that is As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow. It is one of the most heartbreaking books I have ever read in my entire life. It is also one of the most heartwarming books I've ever read in my entire life. This book made me so sad and so happy. Sad because it's so real and the story was written from such a place of raw and true emotion but it's also so heartwarming because it's written from that place as well. So I decided to start as long as the lemon trees grow and I was listening to the audiobook while I was cooking just now and I'm like several chapters in and this is so fucking good guys. I am in love. It follows this like 18 year old main character who was a pharmacy student in Syria and ends up having to take on the role of a surgeon and a doctor at the hospital and she is just struggling so much and she is trying to weigh the decision of whether she should flee Syria or if she should stay for her country. She only has one of her best friends left who was engaged to her brother or married to her brother and she's pregnant and she's just filled with worry for her friend. I've reached the point where kind of our inciting incident has happened, I think, and that is that she has met this boy who, like 19 year olds, 19 years old, he was meant to be like her betrothed, like they were supposed to be set up for like a marriage proposal but she accidentally meets him because he asks her to come to his house to treat his sister who is like gravely ill and so she comes to treat her and saves her life and oh my god guys i'm loving this like i love our main character i love the discussions that are happening in this book the themes that it's covering and it really really is delving into the topic of like how children in these 
horrific situations are robbed of their childhood, are robbed of their innocence, and the ability to just worry about stupid little things. She's going through so much and I feel so much for her. But another aspect to this book is a fantasy element, and that is the main character is seeing this like apparition or vision-ish of this man who is like basically sort of forcing her and like telling her that she needs to flee Syria and she needs to find a way to do it. And he gives her like these weird visions and he just seems like one of those like creepy figures from like a Studio Ghibli movie. I'm curious to see what's gonna happen with that element, whether it's like a psychological element, mental element, or if it's an actual fantasy element. But regardless, loving this. Okay, so I am super exhausted because I just filmed like four different videos, but I am much farther into as long as the lemon trees grow and I'm loving this so, so much. I have reached the point in the book where a massive twist has happened, which I did not expect, but it was definitely a really well done twist. And I had heard someone talk about it in a TikTok. It was my friend Azanta and I knew something was coming. So it was really cool when it actually happened and I was like blown away. But overall, aside from that, this is just really heartbreaking, but also really sweet and like hopeful, I would say. The main characters are finding love and kinship in this moment that is just so very difficult and while they are dealing with concepts of like leaving behind their homeland and trying to find safety but also dealing with the guilt that comes with that. I don't have much left of the book so I'm curious to see how it's gonna end but I do feel like overall although I love it and although I think it's a very powerful book it's not necessarily like one of my favorite favorites and I think that's partly to do with how fast the romance happens in the book and also to do with the fact that it is a YA romance so it has a lot of those themes so personally I feel like I'm not struck as deeply by it, but I can see how it's like such a powerful book for so many people. I think what is so startling and so heartbreaking about this book is that these characters are meant to be teens, but they are put in this like horrible situation and are robbed of their childhood, of their innocence, of their ability to act like children. They're forced to grow up too fast and they're forced to sort of deal with death and disaster and unbelievable trauma and take it all in stride because they have no other choice. So that was me finishing the last minute of the audiobook of As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow. My God, guys, oh, I am aching for these characters. This book is literally everything. I know I said that, you know, this wasn't a complete favor because it is a YA, so it has that element of it feeling a little bit younger and a little bit extra hopeful, but I think that is the beauty of this book. This is a book that shows all of the bad, but also all of the good, all the beauty, all the love, the tenderness between the main characters, our main girl Salama and her strength and resilience, and then the vulnerability of our male love interest, Kinan, and just his loving, family-oriented nature. I love that these characters connect over Studio Ghibli movies, and I love that this tells the story of people who have no choice but to leave the homes that they love. This was a love ode for Syria and it was just so beautifully done. I think what hit me the most was the chapters at the end where they're leaving Syria and they're refuging. And that's not really a spoiler because the book is sort of leading up to that the entire time. But through all those final chapters, I was thinking of like my mom, my dad, my extended family, the people in my community who also were refugees, who also went through traumatic experiences like this and had to flee the homes that they loved, the homes where they grew up, where they thought their future would lie. It was just so heartbreaking. And like, obviously I will never be able to understand the depth of that sorrow of leaving the place that you are from and having to leave because you have no choice, but also the level of like PTSD and trauma that comes with that. One thing I really love is that, you know, the characters do end up going to therapy by the end, which I think was just so important because the book didn't shy away from the psychological trauma that these characters went through. The last thing I'll say is that I really also loved the addition of Kauf and the idea of him being an embodiment of fear and how that fear played both a good and bad role in Salama's story and how he ended up being partly a protector for her. Fear can be a force that tells you that you need to keep moving, that you need to do the difficult thing because your safety relies on it. This was just so like devastating beautiful and kind of soul-crushing and I'm 
just astounded by how beautiful it was. If you haven't read this, please go read it. I think it's pretty obvious that this was a five-star read for me, one of the best books on this video. With that said, I think it's so interesting that like my opinion on some of these books can be so different from other books on this video, even if the two recommendations are from the same booktuber. So like Hannah recommended As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow, but she also recommended Women Eating, which is one of my less favorite ones on this video. So it's just interesting to see like the level and breadth of taste when it comes to some of these creators. So we're 10 books in and I think I'm gonna finish it off with the 11th book, which will be I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. I've heard so many people talk about this, not only on booktube, but also on Book Talk recently. And this was Jack Edwards' favorite. And I feel like a lot of you have been telling me that you wanna know my thoughts on this. So I feel like this is the one to end the video off with. So it's 5 p.m. and I'm gonna try to read this in one sitting and see if I can give you my final thoughts on this book and all the other books by the end of today. Wish me luck. Next book I wanted to speak about, which is called I'm a Fan. This is by Sheena Patel. It was longlisted for this year's Women's Prize, which is how it kind of came onto my radar. It's a weird book, but so perceptive and so brilliant. I loved this. Okay, it's a few hours later and I am 62 pages into I'm a Fan. The book is only about 200 pages, so I'm a good third into the book. I got sidetracked by a 40 minute phone call with my mom, but I am back to reading and I'm hoping to still finish this by the end of tonight. It is currently 8 p.m., so we're tight on time. But all that aside, I am loving this. I have tried reading this book before. I started it last year on the ebook and was intrigued by it, but I didn't get very far in. And I realized as I was reading this and getting further in that the book has a little bit more to it than I initially expected. So the basic premise is that we're following this main character who is obsessed with this man who she wants to be with, but she's also obsessed with this woman who he is also sleeping with. And the main character that we're following also has a boyfriend and so it's just this messy situation of like multiple affairs but also her being so deeply obsessed with this woman and with this man. And the other element to this is that the woman that she's obsessed with is a bit of an influencer. And so our main character is basically stalking this woman and like constantly watching all of her stuff and screenshotting her stories and doing all this creepy shit. And it's essentially sort of making this commentary on like parasocial relationships and this idea of like thinking that you know someone so well because you see them on social media, but you really don't. You're only seeing a part of them that they put online. And the book also makes some commentary on like just obsession and desire and how we want to be desired and loved and how we can want things that are not necessarily good for us. But I think what is really getting me to like this book is the commentary that it's making on just being a person person of color in these contexts and the class elements and it's commentary on just like the frivolous nature of social media and how sometimes it doesn't allow for the real gravity of art and many other topics. The book is told in sort of like little vignettes or like little chapters that have like some sort of title and they're usually only about a page or two long at most like five pages and although many of the chapters follow the main character and the actual plot although it goes sort of in a convoluted, out of order way. There are also just some chapters that feel a little bit disjointed from the actual narrative. And I could almost imagine them being like written exclusively separate from this novel as something of a musing by the author. Although I really love these musings of the author, I feel like they feel a little bit disconnected from the actual story and the actual character. Like I'm failing to see how the character's perspective on some of these things bleeds into that, but maybe I'm reading into it a little bit. Regardless, I am loving this. Even 60 pages in, this is like packing a punch and I've already like tabbed so many places in the book where there was just a really beautiful turn of phrase or something really funny or where there was like a whole musing on a certain topic that I was like, I wanna come back to this and reread it and like plaster it on my wall. One turn of phrase that I particularly enjoyed was, her body is as fertile as the banks of a river. I want to plunge myself into her. I thought that that was a lovely metaphor and one that was very 
you know, visual. So there you go. Here's another little chapter that I really liked and it goes, who exactly are we addressing our creativity to? What do we hope to gain? What does this do to our voice? Does it matter? How does performing vulnerability and being performative to win the stamp of authority that whiteness brings warp our private, most secret self? Who might we be outside of this one-sided dynamic? We seek to affect the cultural landscape. We take on our parents' struggle as if it were our own while dismissively exploiting the privilege of self-actualization. We are able to ask, who am I? A question our parents were never able to ask themselves. But have we ever stopped to ask what exactly it is we want to gain access to? I thought that that was stunning. But again, this is like one of those chapters that I feel like is a little bit disjointed from the rest of the narrative and seem like just amusing of the authors, but it's like a really great music. Like it's incredible written and I love it but it feels like it's not part of the story. <laughs> I can completely see why Jack really loved this book and why so many other people really love it because it has so many of those like evocative lines. I know Jack has like a specifically interesting reading taste in the sense that he reads a lot of weird and also very literary books which are either hit or miss for me but this one is definitely hitting. It's like 11.30 right now. I don't know why I'm awake. I am a grandma and I need to sleep. However, I have finished I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. And my God, guys, this one threw me for a loop. I loved it. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. This was a level of unhinged that I never expected and a level of unhinged that I never knew I needed. This was just so addictive and just so weird and talks about so many things. And I'm honestly just like envious of the fact that I haven't written this book. But seriously, if you told me a year ago that I would be obsessed with this book based off the concept alone, I would have been like, are you sure? But here I am in love with this book. I totally see why Jack love this book. I can totally see why so many people love this book. I can also see why people would hate this book, but I feel like if you hate this book, it's probably because you didn't see the value in it. You didn't see how it completely obliterates the neoliberalism, the white women feminism and activism, how it portrays a very messy main character that is both relatable and also absolutely fucking crazy. There are so many lines that I was in love with and I highlighted a bunch along the way. And I also like tabbed so many more parts of the book and like folded corners. Like, can you see that? Can you see that? I'm so glad I stayed up to finish this in one sitting because it was honestly so worth it. I know I mentioned that there were parts of this book that felt a little bit disjointed from the rest, but I do feel like as we get into the second half of the book, those parts start to be more integrated with the actual narrative of the book. This was just so stunning and I like don't even know what to say because I'm just like, wow. I feel like this is my favorite type of weird book because it confronts so many different topics of like race, class, sexuality and delivers very messy realistic main characters while also being entertaining as hell like this was so funny at parts as well like i definitely laughed out loud especially when it came to like some of the chapter headings they were just so fucking hilarious and i feel like i have been recently just really enjoying satires like this that sort of take this over exaggerated situation and then delivers like this absolutely fascinating and batshit crazy story. I feel like this book is for the people who loved Yellow Face, for the people who loved Such a Fun Age. I feel like it's also partly for the Sally Rooney girlies. Don't quote me on that, but I feel like Partly it's there. Anyways, this was obviously a five stars and a great way to end off this video. Like, I am so happy that this one ended up being a winner because it would have been real fucking sad if the last book on this video was like a one star or something which i wasn't sure about when i was 
going into this book. I was like, this could be really bad. Obviously, so many of these booktubers have impeccable taste, and I am honored to have read the books that they recommended. With that said, I am too tired to give you a full rundown of all the ratings and my overall thoughts on this experiment, so I will see you at a later juncture when I have had more sleep. Alrighty, we are at the end of this video. I know it's been a long journey and I appreciate all of you for sticking around this long. As promised, I'm gonna go through my final ratings for all of these books, just so you have a final sense of what I thought of all of them. So first up, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. I really, really enjoyed this one and I think my final rating is gonna be a 4.5 stars. For Legends and Lattes, I'm going with a four star. It was super cute and really a fun one to pick up. A bit surprisingly for me, The Seven Year Slip is gonna get a 4.5 stars just because something about the ending and the discussions of grief really gripped me, so 4.5 it is. Another surprising one, None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. This one really freaking hooked me, so it's a total five stars. And then Bright Young Woman, of course, is gonna be a five stars. This was a fucking amazing book and everyone should be reading it. And then Women Eating by Claire Coda. I know I had mixed feelings about this one, but I feel like the more I think about this book, I start to realize that there's so much more to it. So I'm gonna give this one a 3.75 to four stars. And then A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed is a solid four stars for me. It did some really great things with the story, but I do think there's just too much attention paid to the romance. The Writing Retreat, I'm gonna have to give a three stars to because although I really didn't like it by the end and I was calling so many of the twists. I do think it did have some merit to it and the more I think about it, I did enjoy some parts of it. So I'm gonna give it a three. I feel like you can still pick this one up if you're looking for a really, really weird thriller. As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow is definitely a five stars for me. This is such an incredible book and everyone should be picking it up. Like, please, if you're gonna pick up a book on this list, please pick up this one. And then finally, I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel is definitely a five stars for me. This was probably the most surprising book on this list for me and I'm just so glad I ended up loving it. I feel like this entire experiment was just so much fun and I'm so glad that I actually spanned it out over the course of January because I really got to read a lot of great books and I really got to read a lot of books that I typically wouldn't have picked up. I feel like Bright Young Women, Seven Year Slip, None of This Is True, I'm a Fan, Women Eating, even As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow, all of those books were not really ones that I would typically pick up and so I'm so glad that I found more books that I vibe with and I can expand further into some of the genres because I really did enjoy a lot of these books. So with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this ridiculously long feature length film video. I had so much fun making it. And if you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below, hit that subscribe button and leave me a comment on what you thought of all of these books. I would love to hear all of your thoughts and discuss further. Thank you so, so much for watching. And as always, please remember that the story ain't over. Bye. <laughs>